Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Computomics podcast. Today we will be whipping out the proverbial microscope and talking about the microbial dynamics in food ecosystems. Our guest is a food scientist and has worked as a scientific advisor to the Hellenic Food Safety Authority, advising them on microbial hazards. She is professor at the University of Turin and her research there focuses on the microbial ecology of foods. Our guest is also a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Food Microbiology and Microbiology Spectrum. Welcome, Calliope Ranzio. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. The pleasure is ours. Um, and thank you also for allowing me to call you Kelly <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, for the duration of this interview. Um, Kelly, we like to start with an icebreaker in these uh, interviews. And I know that both your research and, and your work before uh, deals with food and fermentation and wine. So I was wondering now if you think we have this interview maybe in a restaurant or at your home table, what food or wine combination would you like to serve or would you see us having? Okay, that's a great question to start with. Uh, so I would uh, <laughs> probably do a, a shrimp pasta with some feta cheese. I'm originally Greek, so feta cheese is a, is a must. And I would have a glass of white wine, maybe a Chardonnay from California. That would be my choice. Sounds delicious. I, I kind of regret asking that question now. <laughs> I'm getting, <laughs> getting hungry. <laughs> I feel my, my stomach growling. Um, Very, very tasty. As a uh, professor at the University of Turin or Torino for the Italian speaking audience, um, what is the focus of your research? So the focus of research is uh, microorganisms in foods. So let me just uh, give a, a brief uh, connection to something completely different, something completely out of uh, science that is a movie. Uh, oh, I love movie. it already. <laughs> <laughs> so a Western movie, I don't know if uh, you probably uh, recall it, uh, the, the Good, the Bad and the Ugly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so microorganisms in foods can be considered as good, as bad or as ugly. <laughs> so the good microorganisms are those that are um, doing the fermentations and are producing good types of foods. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the wine, I mentioned the feta cheese. So these are products of fermentation. The ugly are those that will spoil our food. So for sure you have had in your free, in your fridge fruits that go bad. This is mm -hmm. spoilage caused by microorganisms and the bad, those that are causing disease to humans. Mm. So the focus of my research is to understand how these different groups of microorganisms interact with each other in the food, what makes them survive longer or die off earlier, because these aspects will then be useful for the food industry in order to produce food that is safe for the consumer and food that is of good quality. Good quality that is um, an area that can be considered subjective it depends on the characteristics of uh, and the, the habits of the consumer but some elements of quality are actually can be considered uh, universal so the goal of food microbiologists is to monitor the microorganisms during food production and intervene understand how they can intervene in order to produce safe food of high quality mm -hmm. I mean, very a very important task, <laughs> you, as you as you aptly described. Um, in my in my research before this interview, I read that um, you are especially interested in in combining culture dependent versus culture independent approaches to describe the microbiota and and how I guess its function uh, works in foods. Can you can you explain what that means? Like, what what can we envision when we when we hear this? So the traditional way by which microbiologists uh, studied microorganisms in foods uh, is based on the use of culture media. So you probably have uh, seen Petri dishes, maybe also in uh, on TV these things are uh, shown. So Petri dishes where you have 
uh, a substrate. It's called a substrate. So uh, a, a medium where microorganisms can actually grow. So we take them out of the food and we try to reproduce them in vitro. So this is a culture-based approach. Mm -hmm. This approach has some limitations, some biases, because not all microorganisms are actually able to grow on mm -hmm. these culture media. Okay, so the traditional way by which microbiologists have worked has given us a good idea of the microbial ecology of foods, but not a complete picture of the microorganisms that are present. Mm -hmm. Only those that are able to grow in culture media. So about 25, 30 years ago, culture independent approaches have been developed where we do not anymore try to culture them in media in substrates in the lab, but we extract the nucleic acids of these microorganisms that are present in the food and we analyze directly these nucleic acids. Mm -hmm. This means that we are not introducing this uh, bias of cultivation, we are bypassing this bias of cultivation and we are looking directly into the signature that the microorganisms are leaving in our samples with their DNA or RNA. This is you're describing a development that has already happened for for a number of years now. Uh, what would be a current project where you're employing this this combination or maybe this different approach? Yes. Yeah, so these methods were developed. This way of thinking, because it's a way of thinking mm -hmm. of approaching uh, scientific questions, was developed something at least in food microbiology, something like. 25, 30 years, 25 years ago. And there have been technological evolutions uh, that do not modify the approach. The approach is always the same, but the methodology of analyzing the DNA is improved. Okay, mm -hmm. so while at the beginning we had some what are called gel-based methods, today we have sequencing methods, DNA sequencing methods. Okay, so it's a development in the methodology. And a, a project where we are actually applying these approaches is called SAFI. Um, it is a European uh, funded project. Uh, SAFI stands for Safe Food for Infants. Mm -hmm. And in this project, as um, the name implies, we are focusing on safety. So understanding how pathogenic microorganisms may contaminate foods. Mm -hmm. foods for infants, and how we can understand ways of controlling these microorganisms. Okay, a and within this project, our group at the University of Turin is actually active in applying culture-dependent and culture-independent approaches to mm -hmm. understand the microbiota during processing, during production of infant food. Mm -hmm. And uh, this project is in the middle right now, I assume, like you're in the middle of the, the research phase. Is there, are there any results or preliminary results that you can already share or feel comfortable sharing? So the project is ongoing. And again, one of the objectives is to understand how we can integrate next generation sequencing technologies Mm -hmm. to understand the microbiota, the evolution and the dynamics of the microbiota during processing. And we have taken as example uh, specific companies that are producing infant food, and we have been able to characterize the microbiota uh, in the processing plant mm -hmm. uh, in great detail. And we have been able also to understand how this microbiota fluctuates in time. So the sampling was performed throughout more than a year, and we have seen how the microbiota within the processing plant fluctuates with time, with season. Mm -hmm. And we are in the process now of correlating the composition of this microbiota with specific microbial groups. We consider them target microorganisms. Mm -hmm. to understand if we can identify some composition of the microbiota that specifically indicates to us that the target microorganism may be present in a specific environment. 
All right. So it sounds to me like you're trying to identify, it's almost like a, a, a signal system to maybe find earlier warn, have a, an early warning system. So I don't know, would you shut down the processing or, or be able to, to find issues sooner with food that might be bad or ugly <laughs> to go back to the original uh, image, right? This is exactly what uh, we want to do. And uh, you picked up exactly the essence of it. Um, so the idea is that uh, with this information, the company is able to do or to make a decision that is science-based and evidence-based decision mm -hmm. to intervene if it is necessary. So yes, it, it, it will give uh, a preliminary signal to indicate that there may be a need to intervene at some point, somehow. This is a subsequent step. How to intervene, when to intervene will be right. other questions that we may want to, to ask. But the point is that we identify an area that may require more attention. Mm -hmm. And this is done earlier, and this is done by using a scientific evidence. Mm -hmm. So if I understood you correctly, this is now obviously part of this this research project. So there are there is some kind of research set up in a number of of um, uh, processing sites. Um, how would this work if, you know, once your results are processed, are published, uh, the idea would be to have this kind of system in place in all processing plants that uh, create or that uh, produce infant food? Is that correct? So, yeah, this is another uh, very interesting point that you are raising, whether or not this inf the information from this specific study can actually be extrapolated, if you want, and applied to other um, situations. Mm -hmm. um, in this project, we are developing a proof of concept that this can actually be done. Mm. And we are providing the tools and the approaches on how it can be done. The data that we produce do not necessarily apply to all processing plants. Each processing plant will have its own microbiota and we have to investigate this microbiota mm. individually in order to be able to get, to be able to make decisions, as we said before. Mm -hmm. So, yes, proof of concept within this project results that Uh, verify that this can be done, but the data are not necessarily um, extrapolated to other situations. So it's more about extrapolating the process, if I understood you correctly. So it, you try to reproduce the process by saying, okay, you do the analysis first. Once you have your base analysis, you can then go into the second step and try to create your, your individualized early warning system for your processing plant. Exactly. And within this uh, project, there is the, the, uh, the, the goal also to develop what are called decision support systems. So uh, we feed in data, for example, from uh, culture dependent, culture independent methods. And the output is again a warning. This is a situation that may require attention. This is a situation that goes smoothly. There is no need to intervene. Or this is a situation that we need to investigate a little bit further. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, there will be this uh, decision support system that will help companies that want to invest and apply these technologies in order to facilitate the interpretation of the data and the decision-making process. That's super exciting. So Safe Food for Infants project, uh, what's the runtime? When can we expect these uh, these results and, and uh, helpful methods and systems to be to be ready? So the, the project uh, is running for about a year more. So we still have a year uh, ahead of us. Mm -hmm. uh, some data will become available already within the coming months to, through scientific publications, but also through training. Uh, seminars and training activities for food business operators, but also for scientists that want to be involved in this process. So uh, there will be a gradual release of um, information and updates of the work that is being done within SAFI. Mm -hmm. 
This seems to me quite unusual to have a research project have this form of dissemination as it's going on to have seminars uh, and and workshops uh, for yeah I guess the industry or or other people um, that aren't directly involved with the with the research. How did that that come about? So this is um, again an element uh, to which the consortium has given great attention: the dissemination and the engagement of stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to be able to involve as much as possible uh, companies also in order to understand what are their needs and right. what are the gaps that need to be filled in uh, from their side. Because as, as scientists, we have some ideas, but of course, these ideas have to be complemented and integrated with mm -hmm. the needs of the companies. So we want to hear the companies and try to develop something or adjust what we are trying to develop uh, to their needs. Uh, and this is, of course, done with the companies that are part of the consortium. They have been very helpful in giving us their uh, input. But through the training activities, we would like to get more feedback from other companies that are not directly involved with, uh, with the project. So yes, this is uh, an important element of the SAFI project, the dissemination and the engagement of the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you did say um, a year. So obviously, as our audience, I'm sure is aware, there is sometimes a bit of a gap between the recording of a podcast and the publishing. So um, just to be clear, this would be mid 2024, like end of summer 2024, more or less? Yes, yes, Okay. exactly. Perfect. This is the period. Yeah. Super exciting. And we're definitely going to put the links in the show notes so people can follow up on your publications uh, and, and the kind of intermediate results from the project that are quite substantial from, from what you've just shared already. Um, besides SAFI, the, the Safe Food for Infants project, what other studies or projects uh, do you have going on maybe that you'd like to share? So uh, other projects, uh, other another uh, important project that uh, is actually at the beginning right now uh, is a project that concerns more fermented foods, the other big area that uh, is of particular interest uh, to me. And it is of particular interest also to consumers. Uh, there is a big trend, especially at European level, of consumers that want to uh, do their own fermented food at home, no? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and why is that? Because we we have scientific evidence that fermented foods are good for our health. So why not actually uh, do it at home? And, uh, <laughs> and, and maybe um, have fun with it, save some money by doing it yourself. There are all these reasons that come into it as well, right? Exactly. Of course, there is, there, there is a need for particular attention because, uh, again, uh, fermented foods at home need to be tightly controlled or fermentation processes at home need to be tightly controlled because there are risks for uh, the consumer if they are not performed correctly. But uh, the project that I'm referring to uh, concerns fermented foods in general. Uh, there are many European partners involved and our uh, group is focusing on fermented olives, so Ooh. table olives. Yes. Mm. <laughs> we're, we're talking about food almost too much. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Fermented olives. Okay. And here, what we are trying to understand is what is the influence of the microbiota during primary production? So in the oh, we are going in the olive orchard and we are trying to characterize the microbiota of the orchard, how the microbiota of the orchard is influenced by uh, the season by the year, by the conditions so that are agronomic uh, practices that are performed in the orchard, mm -hmm. and how this is influencing then the fermentation process, so the microorganisms that will take over uh, the fermentation process, and eventually will have an impact on the quality of the fermented food, the fermented olives, but also on the health aspects the health promoting aspects of fermented olives. Mm -hmm. And we want to go a step further and construct microbial consortia that promote uh, health for the consumer. So they have health benefits for the consumer. And we want to use this microbiota during the fermentation process. Now, when you say promote, <laughs> uh, what does that mean? Do you, do you 
input them, you, you actually like manually, or I guess in a machine produced way, you, you input them into the process or you try and, and foster the ones that are already there? Like what, what can mm -hmm. I, what does promote mean in this context? Okay, so traditionally, uh, fermented foods, and especially uh, some types of fermented foods, such as uh, cheese, for example, or wine, to a certain extent, fermented sausages, they are what they are artificially inoculated. So the, the raw material that is used for the fermentation is artificially inoculated with a microorganism that is called the starter culture. Mm -hmm. So this is a concentrated microorganism that we know has been previously selected for its characteristics, and we inoculate it in order to take over the fermentation. Mm -hmm. in, in other fermented foods, this is not happening. So what happens is that we have a natural selection of the microbiota that was originally present in the raw material. Mm -hmm. For example, in sauerkraut or in kimchi. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes there is no inoculation. So they are the microorganisms that are present in the raw material that will um, be selected because we are adding the salt, because we are adding the brine, or because we are removing oxygen. We are changing some physicochemical parameters that will give the opportunity to a subset of microorganisms to develop and ferment. Going to the origin, I went a little bit off here. No, this was <laughs> going great for understanding, though. <laughs> uh, so going to the original question that uh, you uh, you asked me, yes, the idea is that in the fermented olives now, in this project, we are not inoculating a single microorganism, but we are inoculating a microbial community that is carefully mm -hmm. selected for certain technological characteristics or for certain health-promoting characteristics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will study these microorganisms, try to understand how we can put them together in a microbial consortium, and then inoculate this microbial consortium in the olives at the moment of the harvest in order for them to develop during fermentation. Interesting. And, and this will have as a, as a, what is what we expect out of this process, that uh, the quality of the olives is high, and that potentially we have microorganisms at the end of the fermentation that are uh, that may have some health promoting effect so mm -hmm. a benefit for the consumer mm -hmm. you you spoke when you spoke earlier about um how technology has changed and how that has changed some approaches or maybe um, infuse them or put them to another level. Um, I'm wondering now about this process here as well and, and how far do you use uh, maybe DNA sequencing here as well or, or different kind of high-end modern technologies to go through that selection process and also maybe the introduction process? Yes. So um, we heavily rely on next generation sequencing technologies in, within this project. First, to understand the microbiota in the orchard, are we, as we said before. So a description of the microbiota by um, a high resolution technology such as the next generation sequencing. And we will use these technologies also when we will try to construct the consortia. We, because in this, because we intend to use sequencing to understand what are the characteristics of these microorganisms at genomic level. So we will study the genomes. Mm -hmm. From the genomes, we will infer what are potential functions mm -hmm. and try to mix together microorganisms with different genomic backgrounds mm -hmm. in order to construct this uh, ideal microbial consortium. So yes, also in this project, we heavily rely on um, next generation sequencing. Of course, we have to combine culture dependent approaches as well, because if at some point we want to inoculate these microbial consortia in the olives, we have to have them in our <laughs> collections. We have to have these microorganisms. So we never forget the classic microbiology that is fundamental. Uh, in, cam in capturing also the biodiversity, the microbial biodiversity, and conserving mm. this mm. microbial biodiversity. And we are also moving towards new ways of conserving microorganisms, not anymore as a pure culture, but as 
consortia, microbial consortia. So we want to understand how mm. we can actually conserve entire microbial consortia. But this is another project. <laughs> I, I get the sense we could keep going and going um, because they are, they are related and, and super fascinating and super relevant for sure. Um, but I, I suggest you just come back maybe in a year's time or two years time to to talk a little more about Safi, which will be um, through that stage at least, and um, possibly any developments in the conservation techniques. Uh, this was lovely, Kelly. Thank you so much for being here and sharing all of this with us. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was a, a real pleasure to talk about these fascinating aspects of science. Thank you, Anna. You're welcome. Thank you for listening in today. Want to learn more? Then check out our show notes and more info on computomics.com. If you have questions or want to propose a next guest, please reach out to us at podcast at computomics.com.